right, so today's lesson, uh, we're going to be talking about Newton's second law of motion uh, in dealing with sports. Uh, this is a, a law that's actively used and it's in everyday, uh, everyday life. Uh, my group members are Jose Francisco Gutierrez, myself, Ernesto Guevara, and uh, Ricardo Campos. Now, uh, let's move into things. As you, um, Newton's second law of motion is described by uh, acceleration is produced when a force acts on a mass or an object that weighs something. Now, uh, with that being said, we can see that the greater amount of the mass of the object, the greater amount of force that is needed to produce acceleration to get that object moving. And with that being said, acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the object, which means you can uh, figure this out easily as we move forward. We're going to see how the equations go into factor. Now, what does all this mean? Um, to put it into basic terms, force is determined by multiplying the mass of the object being moved by the force, well, I'm sorry, by the acceleration of the force moving the object. As you can see, the acceleration of force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, inversely, we can find acceleration by dividing the force over the mass of the object. This is exactly what I was talking about. Acceleration can be found by dividing the force by the mass of the object. Hello, my name is Jose Gutierrez. I'll be talking about Newton's second law of motion and how it pertains to running. From our previous most runners want to achieve the maximum amount of acceleration in the quickest way and the most efficient way. So how can we use Newton's second law of motion during their training to help them achieve that? Well, there's quite a few ways we can help them do that. We already know from our previous slides that force equals mass times acceleration. Or, another way of using that formula is acceleration equals force over mass. When it comes to training, we can increase the mass of the runner by giving them either hand weights or a weighted vest to stimulate the lower leg muscles to produce more force during their training, thus giving that runner more acceleration when that vest is removed or when those weights, that extra mass is removed. Uh, another way of producing that type of uh, effect is by increasing the amount of force that the runner is running on or the runner has to produce, not by increasing their mass, but increasing the force they're working against. For instance, um, we have what's known as resistance training, running, changing the surface on which a runner runs. For instance, running on pavement or running on the sidewalk, a runner produces a certain amount of force, but when the runner is, that terrain is changed to, let's say, thick grass or sand, the runner's muscles will have to adjust, producing more force to get the same amount of acceleration due to the fact that the, gra the grass, as well as the sand, or even running against the wind or up a hill, Will, will absorb or counteract the force as a resistance force that will counteract the force they're outputting. Um, also, something similar as um, running um, with the parachute would do the same effect if there's not a large wind or hills to run up with. Um, we kind of start getting near into biomechanics. Um, biomechanics, running, and Newton's second law. So, how can biomechanics help with this? Well, biomechanics will allow a runner to produce the most amount of force that their muscles can produce without changing their mass, as just only by making them more of an efficient runner. So here we have the gain cycle of runners. Um, elite runners tend to use a more dorsiflex foot running, meaning that they tend to land on the balls of the feet. They choose this type of running due to the fact that it produces less resistance force and or what you, some people call friction, I meaning when they hit the ground, there's less friction um, when they make that contact. Uh, another thing that we can use at Bible Mechanics Newton's second law comes into play is uh, we can say tall runners. Taller runners will have a greater foot speed, meaning they can get from point A to point B quicker because they have a stronger, uh, longer stride with less steps. But due to their heavier leg muscles and due to the fact that they have more mass because they are taller, they will have um, a trade-off there. You can get to one place faster, but as well as they, they have to carry more mass. Shorter runners kind of have the opposite problem. Shorter runners have a greater foot, have a, a, can put output greater force, but they have less foot speed, meaning they take more steps to get from point A to point B, but because they're making contact with the ground, what, the ground much more quickly, they can produce much uh, a faster forward momentum. So, 
what does this mean? What, what, what can we do with this information? Well, for instance, uh, the forefoot strike pattern helps eliminate forces that work between the angles of the joints, and thus with these forces not working against the body of a runner, <clears throat> one can accelerate to a faster speed and quicker, as well as maintain that speed more efficiently. It's basically saying, when just by changing certain biomechanics in the body, we can, we can get this more force produced by those muscles with, by out, at the same time, eliminating some of that resistance force that you might find within the body itself. For instance, um, the arms. The arms are already part of the mass of the body, but when the arms are used effectively, you can use the arms to help add extra force or extra momentum to a runner by helping extend the hips when the person is running, or by shifting the body weight to the center of the body, making the runner more able to stay erect and have a better form in running. It also helps shorten the stride length and increase stride frequency, meaning you make contact with the ground more, more often, meaning you're having more of a power to go ahead and propel yourself forward. Um, that's basically what we can do. All right, now that we've seen uh, kind of how we can uh, manipulate a little bit of Newton's second law to play to our advantage, uh, let's actually put this rule into play. Uh, we're, today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Newton's second law in football. You know, in football, it, it's very important to uh, obtain the net force uh, at which the, at which, for example, players are colliding. Oftentimes on the offensive line, you get two players going at each other, one player is going to win the block most of the time. Sometimes you do get a stand up and nobody moves anywhere. But uh, in football, you know, we can determine the force exerted by players by determining how much weight the losing opponent uh, weighs uh, versus how much, well, multiplied by the acceleration at which that opponent is moving either backwards, forwards, side to side, and from there. And just for repetition purposes, we do have Force is the F, mass is the M, acceleration is A, and we know that force equals mass times acceleration. Now, let's put this rule into play and let's actually do a little bit of math to kind of figure out, you know, how this rule applies and how to put the application of it into play. Here you can see two offensive linemen going against each other in the picture. We have John in the gold hat, we have Bob in the white hat. Bob seems to be a little smaller and not doing as well today in practice. Uh, John, in the gold hat, weighs 125 kilograms, and he is exerting about 60 newtons of force. Now, Bob, on the, un, uh, on the other hand, is about 118.2 kilograms, and he is exerting about 48 newtons worth of force. We want to figure out how much force is exerted in, in total, and who wins the battle, ultimately. Now, as we stated earlier, we need to figure out the net force. We need to figure out how much force is exerted in which direction it's going. Uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, we get uh, John exerting 60 newtons, and we have Bob exerting uh, 48 newtons. That's going to give us a, a net force of 12, so that's where we got the, the force there. Now, as we can see in the picture, we have uh, Bob on the losing end. As we stated, 118.2 kilograms is what he weighs in. So we get 12 uh, equals, we don't have our acceleration yet, so that's what we're looking at. So we have 12 equals 118 times what is the acceleration. If we do the math, a nice little handy dandy calculator might help us out just for you know, purposes of speeding this up. We found out that 12 over 118.2, uh, as we mentioned earlier, acceleration is the inverse of the mass. So 12 over 118.2 equals uh, 0.10 meters per second squared. That is the acceleration at which Bob is moving backwards, and we have a net force of 12, which is the, the, the outcome, the um, amount of force that is acting against Bob. Okay. Now, um, as you can see, John won the battle here. All right, hello class, my name is Ricardo Campos, and I will be uh, explaining Newton's second law of motion in baseball. So as you can see, Newton's second law is a net force that is applied to an object that is equal to its mass multiplied by its acceleration. Uh, right now, you see a picture of a batter swinging the bat. Um, I'll explain right now uh, what causes the force, what what is the mass, and what causes the acceleration in order to in order for a player to hit the baseball effectively. What is force, acceleration, and mass when a batter is hitting a ball? Okay, so the force that is generated from the player is the hips from the player that is causing the force. Acceleration is generated from the hips motion. And mass 
Okay, so to obtain the largest amount of force, the player would need to be able to accelerate his hips along with having a mass to strike the ball. So basically, um, it is not all about upper, upper body strength, lower body strength. You need to add all of these things together to get an effective swing to hit the ball effectively. <clears throat> Instead of linear motion that generates the force, a baseball swing is calculated using rotational motion. Rotational motion is similar to circular motion, except the object involved is a rigid body, which all points rotate around the center of mass of the object and not around a fixed point. Okay, so Newton's second law still applies, but the force equation is transferred into rotation force. So force would be <coughs> would be torque. The mass is replaced with a quantity called inertia. And the acceleration is now called angular acceleration. Okay, so here's the formula. Torque equals inertia times angular acceleration. The torque then is dependent on the radius. The smaller the radius is, the larger the angular acceleration is. When a player lowers the radius of his bat, he will have a smaller moment of inertia and a larger acceleration, maximizing his torque. So here's a picture of a batter swinging the bat. The vertical line is the approximate axis of rotation. The blue line would be the radius. And the green lines demonstrate the estimate of ball bat contact location on the bat. Okay, so Newton's second law of motion uh, applies Basically, anywhere in sports, uh, Newton's second law is always in play. Um, understanding is important, and physics can also help improve your performance in any sport baseball, basketball, running track, wrestling. Uh, basically, any sport, the second law is always in play.